Okay, so I mean, it's it's obviously going to be a hard fork, meaning that when it happens, everyone's going to have to run the latest implementation of Monero, and that's that I think we're going to see that all over the internet, like upgrade now and it's released. When do you when do you foresee it being released? This project probably won't go live until 2024 or later because there's a lot of work to be done. Validating the new stuff will require a lot of very careful analysis and uh, probably third party like auditing firms coming in to look at the code and the, the ideas. I'm personally still writing code to like, like prototypes to demonstrate how it all works so that uh, other developers can come in and flesh out the picture. What up, vigilantes? I have the one and only Cole with us today, and he his talk was on Seraphis and Jamtis, which will be upgrades to the Monero protocol. If you could please give us an explanation of what Jamtis and Co is for someone, for the lay person, right? And what does that mean for Monero once this upgrade happens? And how will it change? How will things change? And what do you expect from a practical perspective? Surface and Jamtis. Surface is a new transaction protocol for Monero, which means it replaces the current transaction protocol so that. The, the machinery that allows you to transfer money from yourself to other people. The reason you, you want to ch change this protocol is because there's a lot of cryptography involved in, uh, in the, the transfer of funds so that the, this, the transfer is very private. So all the privacy components are based, based on different cryptographic techniques. So moving to a new protocol lets you use new or better techniques or a better design uh, that gives you more, like for example, more flexibility when you construct a transaction. So Jamtis is a so-called addressing scheme that allows you to have different kinds of wallets with different cap capabilities that uh, can improve the user experience a lot. So from a privacy point of view, Surface will allow us to use uh, much more efficient ring signatures. And so these ring signatures are a proving technique that lets you hide what you're spending when you spend it. So the transaction that goes into the blockchain, it records all the information about the money you're spending. You want all the information to be hidden from people who are looking, but you also want those people who are looking to be able to be confident that when you that the money you're spending, you actually own that money. It's money that exists in the chain. So when the transaction says that it's spending money that's in the in the ledger, uh, what what we do with a ring signature is reference uh, a small group of, of funds that exist in the ledger, and we say, I'm going to spend one of the members of this small group. And so the observer can be confident that you're spending money that's in the in the ledger because. Uh, the small group is all all contains members from the ledger, and you are proving that you you all you are spending one of those members. But this is this 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 member you set you're referencing is pretty small. If it's bigger, then an observer has less of an idea about what money you're spending. So with with Surface, you can have larger sets of funds being referenced when you make a transaction. Uh, the, other, the other major advantage to Seraphis is the introduction of Jamtis, which is a addressing scheme. So the, the addressing scheme is, you can think of it as, so when you send someone money, the money kind of lands in the address that you provide to the sender. So say you want to send me money, you give me an address that I can send money to. I send money to the address and then when you are looking in the ledger you will see see the transaction that I sent and then you will figure out that 
the funds in that transaction belong to the address that you gave me. That's like the high level of what an addressing scheme does. With the current addressing scheme, it's only possible to have two kinds of wallets that can interact with addresses. So you have a, a main wallet. This is like the normal wallet that everybody has. Uh, this wallet lets you see all of the funds that exist that are owned by an address and also see all the funds that have been spent from that address. So it's the full balance in the address. The money that goes in and the money that has been spent out of that address. You also have the view only wallet, uh, which can only look at, which can only see the funds that go into the address. It can't see the funds that go out. So the view only wallet, it's not as useful as we'd like it to be because it can't see the full balance. So if you if you look if you're looking at your trying to figure out your balance by looking at a view only wallet, it won't be very accurate. So it's not very useful. But with with Jampus, we're able to have a view-only wallet that can see the full balance in your account. I think this is going to be a, a significant user experience improvement because you can have view-only wallets that the wallet can't spend funds, but it can view all the funds that you own directly. So you can, you can separate the power to spend funds from the power to view funds. And this lets you uh, keep your, your funds a lot more secure uh, in, the, in like the, the more powerful wallet. So you can have like a hardware wallet that is secure, that can spend funds, but you don't have to you don't have to interact with that unless you actually want to spend funds. You, all you have to interact with is like your phone, for example, that can view the funds. This is like the, the experience you'd expect to have with a cryptocurrency. So being able to see your funds is easy and complete. And then being able to spend funds is a little more difficult, but straightforward. So you can think of the Jamtis addressing scheme as giving us what we expect to be the behavior of wallets, rather than what we have now, which is kind of annoying in some cases. There's a lot of, there are a lot of other like smaller things, I think, but those are the, the main ideas. So the larger ring sizes, Ring signatures, the big ring signatures, and the uh, better wallet distinction between a fully fully powered wallet and a view wallet. So the the way that the addresses are configured in Monero right now, that will change, correct? Uh, that's right. So from the, from the user's point of view, uh, all the all the addresses that have you currently have uh, won't work anymore. So. If you try to send funds to those, nothing will happen. Your your wallet will throw an error. Say you need to upgrade your wallet to the new wallet, and then once you've upgraded, it'll spit out new addresses with a new format. They'll look different, but you can send money to them just as normal. So right now we have these sub addresses, which are like different addresses within your account that own funds. So they're like sub accounts you can think of. They're, they're kind of like sub accounts. So. The old sub accounts will line up with the new ones, so one to one. So there, there, there won't be any like confusing new interface to deal with. It'll just be that you have to upgrade and you have to generate new addresses. Everything else will be the same. Okay, so I mean, it's it's obviously going to be a hard fork, meaning that when it happens, everyone's going to have to run the latest implementation of Monero. And that's I think we're gonna see that all over the internet. Like upgrade now, it's released. When do you when do you foresee it being released? This project probably won't go live until 2024 or later because there's a lot of work to be done. Validating the new stuff will require a lot of very careful analysis and uh, probably third party like auditing firms coming in to look at the code and the, the ideas. I'm personally still writing code to like like prototypes to demonstrate how it all works so that uh, other developers can come in and flesh out the picture so to speak how many audits uh, external audits do you foresee uh seraphis and, and Jamtis um attaining random x we saw four probably as many as we can get so <laughs> i don't know probably a lot the, the amount of code, code involved is way larger than the amount of code with RandomX or Bulletproofs, and uh, the amount of changes are way larger, so 
probably get it, you probably want to get a, a large scale audit from the, as many qualified people as you can find. Uh, the, the expense involved with that might be uh, daunting, so I think it's something to think about carefully. I think I think uh, this is a very important issue for all of us that love Monero, and I think we're all going to go back it up as, as much as we can. I mean, the the backing of Random X was pretty successful. I mean, within uh, three days, it was already fully funded. So, um, yeah, I think I think we're all going to be rallying behind this effort. And and so, can you please speak to us as to like what was it that like the Monero community like? Obviously, there's different categories of importance that contributors kind of have to maybe think about like okay this upgrade will be important in the future or this other upgrade this other upgrade and this is maybe what's possible now and maybe this will be possible later that has to be uh, like a, a very interesting process of discernment could you please tell us about this maybe give us some inside scoop as to like how is it that the Monero community of contributors actually come to a, a consensus of like this is probably the path to go now so there are a few things. So one one important way that uh, we we make progress in the development community is having very like a small set of goals. So improving privacy, improving efficiency, improving user experience. That's about it. So by focusing on very specific goals, we're able to narrow in on okay, is is this is per pursuing this change worthwhile? If it's worthwhile, then go for it. If you can't like convince most people that it is worthwhile, then it kind of stagnates and dies. So it's kind of it's, it's not like a step by step process. It's more like presenting an idea, seeing how people react to it, and if there's not like a large amount of support, then it just dies. And if there is a large amount of support, then like naturally it progresses through the development process because at each step of the way it has the support required to make progress to the next step. Wow, that's fascinating, man. That's beautiful. And and, 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 and maybe you can give us a little scoop behind like maybe like the way you guys talk with each other. Uh, are you guys uh, pretty like like serious about like or you guys joke around banter like uh, what is the vibe what is the, I mean I'm, I'm pretty sure you get to under like see personalities and come out like how is that um, it's a very uh, technical community for sure a lot most of the people there are very focused on the technical like, like the code or the, the protocol or the processes or there's, there's plenty of people who are like pie in the sky kind of types who like to go off on talking about ideas they have, right? They want to tell us their ideas. And so I think those are the most uh, prolific writers in, in the community. There's certainly plenty of jokers around. I think Monero Moo has the, uh, the sharpest sense of humor. Always coming up with uh, witty little comments. I enjoy. So in other words, you guys are having fun then? I think that's maybe an overstatement. So you're not having fun? I think, or is it serious? Are you guys I, serious all the time? I think that we... Um, or is it both, a mix? I think we, I think we enjoy making progress towards uh, higher goals or contributing to something that feels meaningful. I don't know if you can get involved in an era to have a lot of like uh, excitement. But. Well, I don't know about that. It is exciting to like encounter new ideas. I just don't know if fun is the right word to talk about like uh, something you're doing that's very technical. Rewarding. Rewarding, yes, that's a good word. So it's rewarding and, and, and you guys, yeah, it's awesome, dude. So, I mean, when you meet maybe one of these guys that you got, got to know very well online, like how is it when you meet him in person? Honestly, I was uh, pretty like anxious. The, yesterday and this morning, but meeting everyone here, it's. I feel like I've already, I already know them because <laughs> I've spent a lot of time online with them. And I don't know, it's been a good experience. Awesome, man. Well, thank you so much for being with us, and, and thank you so much for your hard work. And we are definitely going to be helping in the funding process and, and promoting the, the fact that this is, you know, this is the way to go. 
for anyone out there, any programmer out there that is looking at Monero, that is thinking about maybe jumping in and contributing in any way, where would you direct them? What what expectations do you think they should have? My role is in the research, like very research focused area. So I would say that someone who's interested in research should begin by gaining a deep understanding of how Monero works. To do this, you can go read my book, Zero to Monero 2, and then, of course, asking questions because that book is already out of date. It moves that fast, huh? Well, it's already been two years. So yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, once you understand how Monero works, that's, that's when you can start questioning how it can be better. It's kind of a long journey, but it's kind of a necessary one since the, the technology involved is so complicated. But in terms of like more general development of the code base, um, I'm really not an expert in that area, so I can't speak more. I'll come out that way. Right on. Okay, sounds good. All right, well, thank you so much for being with us, Ko, and, and yeah, hopefully we have many more Monerotopias and many more Monero conferences, and, and we look forward to the process in which, you know, has been started with Seraphis and Jamtis, and, and yeah, thank you so much for everything, man. For really appreciate it. Thank you. Despite capital inflows giving the illusion of dollar superiority, a new video report reveals shocking reasons the U.S. dollar is facing a full-scale worldwide rejection. Watch this free report to understand how to confidently position yourself for what could become the biggest short opportunity in history. Go to dollarvigilante.com short to get this video report for free for a limited time.